So um, I'm Dr. Ashton Robinson-Cook, OU alum and meteorologist at the Storm Prediction Center. And I'll be talking to you about seasonal severe thunderstorm and tornado forecasting. Uh, a lot of the interest in this topic of seasonal tornado forecast peaked during the historic 2011 uh, tornado season uh, in the spring and early summer where uh, President Obama asked about a seasonal forecast for tornadoes. Um, the first tornado outlook that I'm actually aware of is, uh, was issued in 2009 for the upcoming uh, El Nino winter of 2010. And I based a lot of that outlook, I actually created it, I based a lot of that outlook on uh, some research that I did with Joe Schaefer on uh, tornado counts, tornado climatology as a function of, of uh, El Nino and uh, how El Nino influences that. So uh, here's an excerpt from that outlook, that exper experimental winter outlook. I won't read all that. But essentially the out outlook did work out. Um, I expected tornadoes to be to occur and be fairly concentrated along the southern tier of the U.S. And there were a couple of outbreaks that occurred, one in January 2010 in northeast Texas and Louisiana, and another one there in the Carolinas. So it really lined up well with the research that I did uh, leading up to that event. A lot of the diagnostic and uh, forecasting techniques are mostly based on El Nino, La Nina, and they're in their infant stages and they're really um, developmental, experimental at this time. Uh, a lot of the forecasts that I've done so far are based on two papers, the first Cook and Schaefer in my Thoreau review in 2008, and then also some results that I'll have in this presentation based on a lot of my dissertation that I just recently published in an AMS journal in 2017. Um, John Allen et al., his group, looked at uh, El Nino Southern Isolation and related to an index that he created as a proxy for a severe thunderstorm, uh, hail and tornado events. And then also Sankey Lee uh, et al. down in uh, uh, AOML, he looked at oceanic sea surface temperature patterns and their relationships to large tornado outbreak events. There are other factors for predictability, but they're mainly focused on uh, sub-seasonal time frames, usually around the one week to one month uh, time frame. Uh, Victor Gensini, uh, his work on the angular momentum budget is the foundation for his uh, extended range tornado activity forecasts that he issues in the spring. And then Brad Barrett, who's also an alum here at OU, um, led work on the Madden Julian oscillation and its relationship to tornado activity. And then more recently, uh, Malina et al., which is part of uh, John Allen's research group, have studied uh, Gulf of Mexico season for temperatures and their influences on. Uh, seasonal hail and tornado activity. Uh, so the Climate Prediction Center has this schematic on their website that really outlines the influence of El Nino La Nina on North American weather uh, conditions in the wintertime. Uh, during El Nino, there's a persistent extended Pacific jet stream, also known as a subtropical jet, that's displaced to the south across the southern tier of the United States. And what that typically does is that shifts the surface cyclone track, which is tied to the jet stream, uh, to the south in the portions of the southern U.S. And so what that does is that prevents the evection of warm, moist air masses from the Gulf of Mexico in the, into inland areas uh, like you would otherwise get in uh, La Nina conditions. Now, this isn't a, a guarantee that just because you have a La Nina that there's going to be a big tornado in the wintertime somewhere, but oftentimes in the La Nina, you get a much more variable polar jet uh, that tends to dominate. And um, the subtropical jet is, 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 has a weaker influence. You also get surface cyclone tracks that extend farther north into, uh, like the, uh, into the central plains and also the northern plains, uh, Great Lakes region. When that happens, you can get more frequent intrusions of warm, uh, moist gulf air into inland regions of the central U.S., and you can also get increased in, increased in tornado activity, also hail and damaging wind as a result of that. Uh, in more recent results from the paper that I just published, I showed that 
this El Nino influence actually extends into April as well. And I went far more detailed with the analysis of atmospheric conditions than what I just showed you in the uh, previous CPC schematic. But essentially, for all of the metrics here in this table, um, and there is a link to this paper online that I can circulate around later, but essentially, for all metrics of tornado activity, uh, La Nina tends to be more active and foster more active tornado activity in January, February, March, and April than any other phase of ENSO. Much more than El Nino and then a little bit more than uh, neutral. And that's the place for tornado days, tornado outbreak days when you normalize those against the frequency of El Nino versus La Nina versus neutral events in each of these months. Uh, the paper that I just recently published and my dissertation also show that their tornado activity in La Nina is more frequent and in farther north latitudes, just like I described earlier, uh, during La Nina conditions, and that activity tends to be displaced to the south during El Nino conditions. So I have January raw counts of tornadoes on the left-hand side of this schematic, and on one degree, my one degree grid with a Gaussian smoother applied. And on the right-hand side, I normalized those counts based on the frequency of El Nino and La Nina events. And essentially what you see here, and I have highlighted, circled there, is a more frequent uh, bullseye of tornado events there in northeastern Arkansas and into the mid-Mississippi Valley, whereas in El Nino, a lot of those, uh, the, the highest tornado frequency is just placed to the south from Texas over to Mississippi. Same thing is the case for February. You can see there, particularly on the right-hand side, the normalized counts. Florida is really active in February. There's been some really high-impact tornadoes that have occurred in the 2000s uh, down there that were likely attributed to El Nino, um, whereas in La Nina, you tend to have more activity there from you know, Arkansas, Mississippi, I mean, uh, and Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and that region. Uh, similarly, that's the case also for March. You get, in general, more activity in La Nina. There's also an area of higher concentration there in Illinois and Indiana. Um, and then moving forward to April, there's a really big difference in the uh, central and northern plains from eastern Nebraska, eastern Kansas, over to uh, Illinois, Indiana, and uh, western Ohio. And that was one of the biggest shifts that I saw uh, in my work. Notice here also that Oklahoma Tornado Alley gets tornadoes in each phase, regardless. You know, so ENSO can be a little bit less of an influence on tornado activity in Oklahoma compared to some of the peripheral regions in Tornado Alley, and even outside of the typical Tornado Alley, like the uh, Ohio Valley, uh, uh, Iowa, uh, Nebraska, that region. Again, just as I, I mentioned previously, the southward displacement of tornado activity in El Nino is linked to the shifts in the uh, mid and upper level jet that you typically see during El Nino conditions. And notice there on the left hand side of the plot down below, there's monthly anomalies of scalar wind at 300 millibars. That's a proxy for the subtropical jet. And you see those anomalies are really strong from just north of Hawaii across Mexico and into Florida. Whereas in La Nina, there's actually negative anomalies in that same exact region. And that same displacement is also observed within outbreaks, especially in February, March, and April. So let me back up. This is a seasonal average for all days in January, whereas these are composites from individual outbreaks in January. And that's one of the things that my more recent research really added beyond uh, what most climatological studies have done is they've looked at actual tornadoes, but then also looked at entire seasons worth of data, whereas I focused more on the days that actually had outbreaks. So you see um, 
there's a lot stronger jet in several of the composites there in La Nina, January, across the Pacific Northwest. But then when I move forward to February, you really begin to see some of the big differences show up between El Nino outbreaks in February and La Nina outbreaks in February, particularly with that subtropical jet. And again, that's linked to where your surface cyclones tend to occur. Um, and again, that's also linked to where your low-level jets occur. They're all, all linked processes. Uh, we see the same also in March, especially across the south and southeast, Louisiana and Alabama. And then in April, uh, again, the magnitude of your jet is going to be generally weaker because your westerlies are retreating to the north and weakening as we're progressing to the warm season. However, in El Nino April, there's an area of, of a stronger flow across the southeast. And while that may not be a huge deal, that actually can be pretty significant uh, in terms of tornado activity down in that region. And there was one outbreak in 2010 that really, really shows up in some of my tornado statistics down in this region. There was a long track tornado that went through Yazoo City, uh, Mississippi, uh, and that was during the El Nino. We also see those same shifts in the low level jet streams for each of these composites. So this is for January, uh, but then moving forward to April, I'm kind of short on time, so I won't show every single result, but I have more available on the web as well. But in, in El Nino in April, you tend to see the, the uh, low level jets in several of these outbreaks displaced to the southeast in El Nino. And then there's more of a, more of a westward shift and northward shift and some increase in intensity too in some of these low level jet uh, jets in these uh, in these individual composites during La Nina. Uh, evidence of that northward shift in a low level jet is also apparent during an independent study of the outbreaks in all months of the study period. And this is for all days, so not just looking back to the individual days anymore. But you can see this big, this very strong anomaly there right there over the central plains that you don't see in El Nino conditions. So that was one of the biggest takeaways from my previous work. Uh, I also highlighted shifts in surface cyclone activity in April. Uh, you see the highlighted area there where there's a concentration of surface cyclone positions in each of my composites in La Nina, April. And in La Nina, you don't see that uh, concentration not nearly as strongly. There's also a shift in the uh, static stability, or static instability in this case, uh, gauge via lift and index. In each of the composites, there's an increase in activity across the northern plains, increase in instability. Um, and in El Nino, you just don't get that, that, that instability shifted to the south and also to the east, and focus more on the lower Mississippi Valley. There's also a weak relationship uh, that is there and is apparent in the dry line position. And it's kind of hard to see here. The reason why is because I'm u I've used a, a data set, a reanalysis data set that has a two and a half degree uh, spatial resolution. And so that'll be really difficult for resolving specific locations of the draw line. But you do see some subtleties there in um, the draw line position in several of these composites there in far eastern New Mexico and El Nino versus farther east into uh, the West Texas Panhandle in uh, South Texas South Plains in La Nina, also for neutral. So just to reiterate some of the key conclusions from my previous work, um, there's a, there tends to be at least, a southward displacement of tornado activity in El Nino in January through April tornado outbreaks, and there's a northward displacement in tornado activity in La Nina uh, tornado outbreaks. And the atmospheric climatology that I did and I just presented tends to corroborate these shifts. They're most apparent, most apparent with regard to 850 V component wind, which is a proxy for the low level jet in each of the outbreaks. But then they're also apparent in a 300 uh, hectopascal scalar wind fields, which can give you an indication of where the upper level jet is uh, in your outbreaks and also in the monthly anomalies. There's also shifts in static stability and uh, surface cyclone activity 
as well. Uh, additional recent work, um, I was on the committee of a master's student, uh, Corinne Collins, who did her thesis research at Louisiana State University, and she extended the El Nino body of work in a couple of important ways. Essentially what she did was what she looked at the strength of El Nino, the magnitude of the El Nino uh, are going in the Pacific, and how that influenced tornado activity. And she found some interesting results. One of the biggest things that she found was that the insult tornado relationship extends beyond winter and spring, and there's some small indications that fall may actually be affected by, uh, fall tornado activity at least can be affected by El Nino as well. And so I will leave this up for questions if anyone has them. Feel free to email me at ashton.r.cook at gmail.com. I do continue with this research. Um, a lot of it, in fact, all of it happens in my own personal time. Um, but if you have any questions or any information that you'd like to know a little bit more about this type of study or you want to do a study kind of related to it, I'm all ears and willing to give suggestions where uh, needed. If I can be any help, let me know. Thanks.